Good morning, everyone. Uh, I'm Kate Vire of Amazon. I'm a new member on the Internet Education Foundation, and it's my pleasure to introduce our next speakers for our next conversation. Uh, we have joining us now the House Judiciary Chairman and Chairman of the Congressional Internet Caucus, Bob Goodlat, and he is joined by Fred Ursam um, of uh, Coinbase, a uh, co-founder of Coinbase. Well, thanks very much. Uh, this is something that I uh, really enjoy doing every year. We've had uh, 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 some uh, great uh, industry leaders uh, come to talk to us about new technology two years ago. Uh, we, had, uh, the, uh, uh, we had Travis from uh, Uber. And uh, boy, that doesn't seem new anymore at all, does it? Just two years ago. And uh, uh, we have, uh, last year we had uh, uh, Dropbox. And now we have uh, another great industry to talk about and a great company and a great leader and that's Fred Ursum. Fred uh, is the uh, co-founder and president of Coinbase uh, and uh, he comes uh, to uh, that business from uh, the uh, financial services industry where he was a foreign exchange trader at Goldman Sachs in New York where he manually traded and managed Goldman's electronic marketing mark making platform. Uh, he's also analyzed portfolios at BlackRock, the largest asset manager in the world, and worked in nanostructures research. Uh, he holds a uh, Bachelor of Science in Computer Science and Economics with honors and distinction from Duke University. Uh, and uh, he's taken that uh, experience uh, in the financial services world uh, and uh, translated into the tech world in uh, a whole new form of uh, uh, currency. Uh, and. Uh, uh, I'm just absolutely delighted that you're here. So Fred, tell us a little bit more about yourself and welcome. Thank you. And yeah, I, to be clear, I see myself as a good guy because I'm a technologist first. Um, so as, uh, as the intro said, um, I'm one of the two guys that runs Coinbase, which is the largest Bitcoin company in the world at the moment. Um, I think we see this as a very important innovation um, frankly, one that is a little bit challenging to understand, I think, if you're not a pure technologist, because it's probably most analogous to the internet. It's a very, very low-level protocol innovation that has a lot of broad implications. And we probably, just like the internet, won't see a lot of them for a number of years, which is why, frankly, I'm out here to try to, um, to, try to get your minds kind of spinning around it. So Coinbase, uh, the world's leading Bitcoin company, uh, tell tell them uh, in uh, 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 the amount of time it took us to go up in the elevator uh, what uh, uh, you would want them to tell somebody when they said, oh yeah, I heard Fred Ursum from Coinbase uh, and uh, he does X. Yeah. Yeah. So um, what would they tell their, their friends they're going to use Coinbase for? I think, uh, so the simple way to think about Coinbase is it's kind of like PayPal, but Bitcoin is the underlier rather than dollars or euros or a fiat currency. Um, I think more, more broadly, the way to think about Bitcoin is Bitcoin is kind of doing for transactions what the internet did for information, dissemination, and distribution. It's making everything in order of magnitude cheaper, faster, and arguably most importantly, it's making everything open so that everybody can access it um, anybody can go and build on it, right? That's kind of why we saw this massive wave of innovation with the internet is this kind of concept of permissionless innovation. Um, we basically see Bitcoin as the fundamental infrastructure that'll do that for transactions. And you've got some pretty interesting believers too. Uh, uh, last week you announced the close of, of uh, your uh, latest round of uh, uh, capital acquisition for your company and included some pretty impressive financial institutions including the New York Stock Exchange and USAA Bank. What do these institutions see as the promise of Coinbase and Bitcoins in general? I think they're, they're looking at it in that same way. Um, you know, when the internet came along, you had a lot of companies that ended up being uh, disrupted or had their businesses drastically changed by what the internet allowed. Um, a good example would be the New York Times in 1994. Obviously, their business looks a lot different now. And they probably would have been served well if they had kind of dipped their toe in the water earlier. 
rather than like a lot of companies been scrambling in the late 90s saying, oh, what's our, what's our internet strategy? Um, so I think what you're seeing here is more forward thinking people in financial services taking a look at this, seeing a similar movie having played out before, and really thinking, how do we get some institutional knowledge around this? Because we know it's going to change our business somehow. We might not know exactly how right now, but we'd be well served to have a good level of understanding around it. And yesterday, you announced the launch of the first US-based Bitcoin exchange. I think you're up and operating in 23 states mm -hmm. uh, already. Uh, can you tell us a bit more about that launch, and what does that mean for the average American consumer uh, and or merchant uh, to have a transparent and US-regulated exchange like that? Yeah, I, I, think it's, I think it's really important. So a lot of, for some context here, a lot of the Bitcoin companies or exchanges have been largely operating outside of the United States. Um, a lot of it is, is really for regulatory scrutiny reasons to this point in time. Um, but we did launch the, the first U.S. exchange with some capital from the New York Stock Exchange on Monday. I think this is really important because it, it really lays groundwork and infrastructure that's necessary for other great companies and ideas to be built on top of Bitcoin. It's not a perfect analogy, but you might view this as something like AOL in the early days where by allowing a reasonable exchange from dollars to Bitcoin, you're kind of enabling other parts of the technology, almost like AOL allowed a bunch of people to dial up to the internet and at least kind of get started, get involved. It's, it's a foundation that needed to be there. A lot of people have heard of, <clears throat> of Bitcoins, uh, and some people, I'm, I'm a customer of Coinbase. Uh, I have a, Glad to hear it. Uh, a wallet with the, your company, but a lot of people have heard of it, but have never used it. And uh, I would imagine that that's one of the impediments to growth in the industry. Talk about some of the challenges uh, that uh, this industry faces that you have to deal with. Sure. Um, so part of it is, is simply a, a time thing. So again, thinking about the internet, it took many, many years for us to get from the first web browser in 93, kind of 94 time frame to a place now where we all depend on the internet for a lot of basic parts of our daily lives, right? Fast forwarding, what, 23 years now? Um, so I think there's a similar kind of technological innovation wave that's happening here, ho hopefully over a shorter period of time, um, where we're kind of in Bitcoin where the internet was in 93, 94. That's a part of it. Um, another are trying yeah. to figure out how it works for them, what, why it's important for them, what uh, use they're going to have of it. That's right. And figure that out yet. That's right. I mean, it's, you know, eBay didn't exist right when the internet came out, for example. Neither did Google Maps. So a lot of this stuff just takes time to create. Part of it, um, too, is uh, regulatory understanding and understanding from necessary kind of incumbents. So, for example, it's very difficult to get banked as a Bitcoin company right now. So if you're trying to start uh, you know, a business around Bitcoin, that's just one more hurdle that you, that you need to cross. Um, so hopefully, as people become better educated over time, it, those, those kind of hurdles just get lowered and lowered and lowered, such that more and more great ideas can get built. And how have your conversations been going on right here in, in Washington, which is the, uh, the heart of that uh, yeah. bureaucracy that you have to deal with uh, both uh, here and in the states and internationally? But right here is an important place to have those conversations. How's that going? It's, um, to be honest, it's, it's pretty varied. And I think it's varied mostly because of education level at this point. Um, I think people who understand it are extremely excited about it and are generally supportive. Um, there are times where people are uh, less educated and that could be a little threatening. Um, or they might read slightly more sensationalist media headlines around it. This might, uh, you know, you might view that as the equivalent to like child porn or um, illegal file sharing in the early days of the internet where it seemed very scary because it's a powerful new technology. But again, at the end of the day, it, it really does much more good than harm, I think. And different countries and different states are taking different uh, approaches to this too, aren't they? Some of them are viewing this as uh, a good thing. They want to promote it. They want to be a part of it. Some of them are uh, concerned about it for a variety of reasons. Mm -hmm. Some of them want to treat it as uh, a currency. Some want to treat it as an investment. 
Uh, is that good that we have that kind of competition of uh, ideas about what the place of Bitcoin is in terms of the governments you have to deal with, or is it uh, just making the problem even more difficult? So I think it's, it's good in the sense that you have some geographies and specifically states here where they see the promise of the, of the technology and they're trying to be supportive of it because that keeps others honest in really having to go and understand what they're regulating. Um, there is some bad potentially in this because um, I think people are thinking about this almost a little bit too much from a financial services first perspective where you get people trying to fit old laws um, to Bitcoin where you really get a kind of a round peg square hole problem. Um, for example, money transmission laws, and this is, a, this is at the state level, this is what a Western Union, for example, would be regulated as. Um, those are kind of being applied to Bitcoin right now, and these are laws that were conceived of to regulate literally a physical exchange of cash, not conceived of for the, the kind of the, the internet age of, of how all of this has evolved. Um, and just like the internet, it's an entirely new paradigm where almost by definition, the laws that exist don't fit perfectly. Um, so I think, I think the biggest thing that, that I'm concerned about is regulators and lawmakers really being thoughtful about why fundamentally this distributed system is different than what's existed before and how that may in some cases mean that existing things don't really fit so well. And some have criticized digital currency in general or been suspicious of it uh, as a mechanism for money laundering or other crimes. Uh, uh, frankly, that's true of uh, suitcases full of $100 bills as well. Uh, but tell us some of the, the uh, responses you have uh, to those criticisms and why Bitcoin can actually uh, uh, help in certain areas. Yeah, ab absolutely. Um, I think a good way to, to think about this that, that people could relate to is it's much like the early days of email where you had law enforcement and, and regulators very scared because it seemed that all of a sudden anybody in the world, let's say a terrorist, could instantly send a message from one place in the world to another. That's a very scary proposition the first time you hear it. But fast forward to today, and we all depend on email for our daily lives. And in fact, I believe law enforcement actually likes email more than they dislike it because it creates some kind of trail. The same thing can be said for a cash transfer, right? Um, Bitcoin, I think oftentimes there's this, this large um, misnomer where Bitcoin is seen as anonymous, which almost couldn't be further from the truth. Bitcoin is the most, tran the, the most transparent transaction network that's ever existed because fundamentally for Bitcoin to work, there's a large shared ledger, this thing you might have heard of called the blockchain, where every single transaction that has ever occurred on the network is publicly recorded. It's admittedly at times kind of like IP addresses. It's difficult to resolve exactly who's on one end and who's on the other. But it doesn't give all the information about the transaction. Just, sure. It just shows that a transaction occurred. That's exactly right. So it's, at the end of the day, it is, it is all traced. I think one, of, um, one area the US actually really led the way on here was FinCEN, the money laundering um, kind of division of the, of the Treasury, came out very early in March of 2013 and set forth basic guidelines around how you need to run a Bitcoin business. Specifically, you need to run it just like you run a business with dollars. If you're moving money, you need to be responsible about who's putting money in and taking money out. Um, so again, early days of any technology, this stuff might seem a little scary, but there are pretty good guardrails in place already. And I think this is going to be one of these things where over time it actually becomes a more powerful medium um, than, than it is scary. And there are a lot of people here in the audience who are, are pretty new to Bitcoins in general or Coinbase in particular. Uh, what's the best way for them to learn more? I think the, the highest thing I would recommend is just try to use it. I think learning by doing is usually the best thing. So if you have a friend who has some, have them send you a fraction of a Bitcoin, try to go spend it. You can go spend it at a bunch of online retailers right now. So it took off some of the major ones that uh, are now taking Bitcoin. Yeah, so Overstock.com is the first major one to accept it through us. Um, Expedia, if you want to go plan a, a trip, you can go spend it there. Dell.com accepts it. Microsoft, it, it's, it's really kind of mounting. The, the rough timeline on this is in 2013, there were zero really large merchants who were accepting Bitcoin. And fast forward to today, and there's somewhere around 15 businesses that are 
more than a billion dollars in annual revenue who are. Um, so it's spreading quickly. So I'd advise, go try it out. And I'm admittedly a little bit biased on this one because he's one of our investors. But um, Mark Andreessen wrote a great piece in the New York Times called Why Bitcoin Matters, which I think is probably the single best uh, condensed piece on, on why Bitcoin is going to be an important trend. If we have time for questions, that's where you can start finding out right now. So who's got a, who's got a question for us? It's got to be somebody. Yeah. Yes, sir. From an economic perspective, I say forget the delta. If I'm just looking at volatility of Bitcoin, how can we expect this to be an important part of a currency if it has a volatility well above any other major currency in the world? Uh, and how do we build institutions that can accomplish that? that, can accomplish that? Yeah, that, that's a great question. So um, I would say a couple of things. One, we're in really early days in Bitcoin where speculation really outweighs a lot of practical use at the moment. And we think that will, that will change as time goes on. So that, by definition, kind of reduces volatility. Um, the other thing I would say is that if you just look at foreign exchange markets, you have similar problems, admittedly smaller, with volatility. And what's happened over time is, as markets have gotten more mature, you've had things like derivatives built on top of the currency, which allow you to hedge out risk exposure. So, I would say in three to four years, we could reasonably get to an endpoint where businesses offer a solution where Bitcoin is simply a more efficient transactional rail, and the actual foreign exchange risk is, is hedged out for you as a service. So as uh, uh, use of Bitcoins grows, the, the uh, speculation will become a lesser part of it, and the currency will stabilize. I, uh, I don't think it fluctuates now as much as it did two years ago, and I would expect that trend would continue on in the future. Um, tell us, the folks, a little bit more about Coinbase in terms of uh, the number of customers you have or the number of uh, merchants that you deal with to give them a perspective on how this has grown already. Sure. Um, I mentioned a little bit on the, on the merchant front earlier. On the customer front, um, so keep in mind we started this business about two and a half years ago. Um, we've got a little over two million wallet holders today and it's a pretty US-centric business at the moment. Estimates for Bitcoin wallets around the world are around 10, 15 million. Um, but it, it, it's growing pretty fast. Um, anywhere between five, uh, 50 and 500 million dollars are transacted on the Bitcoin network every day, um, which is something that's, that's growing at a pretty reasonable clip. Again, I think this is, it's much like the internet where when people understand the technology, they start to harness it. Um, classic network effect where this, I think, will likely creep up on people faster than they might expect. Yes, sir. Uh, I was wondering if you have an, an idea of uh, how it might be used in a governance process, for example, in, in voting and uh, decision making and things of that sort. Sure. So this is, um, this is getting into a lot of the other applications of the blockchain, this kind of uh, shared ledger that can prove a lot of different things. For example, a voting system, as, as this gentleman suggested. Um, this is why I th you hear many technologists talking about Bitcoin as an innovation that goes far beyond financial services. You could, for example, build a voting system on top of Bitcoin where everybody is in control of their singular vote. It's auditable by anybody. You could issue, for example, even tickets to a concert on this, which now become freely transferable. You can even bake in rules as to exactly how these transactions have to occur. So um, I think the, the important underlying point here is that this goes far beyond what one might think of in the early days as I'm sending you some dollar value to I'm representing that I own a car deed or a house deed or I voted for this candidate on top of this secure network that can prove Who's really done what? Way in the back. Yes, sir. Thank you. Uh, my question is, is there anything you need from Congress or Washington, D.C., like your highest priority for them to do, or do you just need D.C. policymakers to sort of step aside? Two major things come to mind on that front. I think one huge victory. Um, for the internet in its really formative years was in 1997, the Clinton administration 
put out a very simple kind of guideline document on their view on the internet and how they wanted um, they wanted it to evolve, well, not it to evolve, but how they might view law and regulation around it. Very simple document that outlaid, I, I believe, five bullet points, each no longer than three sentences, with things like, we'll try to come up with a uniform um, state tax policy as to how sales tax is applied, for example. Or in general, we'd like to take a light touch as it evolves, and then as we better understand the technology, we'll go in and, and maybe uh, establish more firm laws. Something like that, where it takes uncertainty out of the ecosystem for entrepreneurs who are trying to build on top of it, and similarly, banks who might want to bank these companies, because frankly, that's, that's a huge challenge. If, if I were to ask for anything else, it would be um, that people like the OCC, for example, who are ultimately kind of the ones regulating these major banks, um, do as much as they can to really understand the technology and enable upstanding companies that are trying to build these great ideas in the space to do so, assuming they're following the, the kind of guardrails set forth by Treasury last year. So your number one wish from government is really what most people in the tech sector want, and that is that government, including the Congress, uh, understand uh, the technology before they regulate it. That's exactly right. And I think um, you know that this stuff always gets a little dangerous if um, you're building a singular company. But when it's an entire protocol where there are many years of innovation that are difficult to predict, I think it only, that, that only becomes more and more important. Absolutely. And uh, as with everything else with the internet, the light touch is what has allowed it to grow and blossom. That's not to say that there isn't uh, the opportunity to misuse any of the technology that we all deal with uh, in the tech sector. But, uh, and, and therefore, government needs to be uh, paying attention to what's going on and doing the right thing to protect the people who are trying to grow the internet and, and create a, a, a vibrant new economy. But at the same time, uh, they can snuff it out if they try to regulate something they don't understand. That's right. And I think, the, frankly, the question about voting kind of gets to exactly that, where most people haven't even conceived of a lot of these things. And that may very well may not exist if you just apply pure financial regulation to it, for example. Sir. Hi. Um, what kind of cost efficiencies does payment with Bitcoin offer versus more traditional payment networks? Yeah, I, uh, this is kind of being realized as we speak. But um, financial services tend to be closed networks. Not everybody can go and join the ACH network or the Fedwire network. Um, Thus, there's a very high barrier to entry, and it's difficult for people to innovate. I think it's one of the classic spaces where it's been very difficult to innovate. I think what Bitcoin does that's very interesting is it flips all that on its head by saying, if you can develop good software on top of it, then you have a good chance of building a good business. So at the very fundamental level, sending or receiving Bitcoin costs less than a cent. And this is why you might hear people talk about Oh, what are you know? Th this could be huge for micropayments. In other words, sending very small amounts of money over the internet, for example, where huge cost efficiencies can be achieved. The other kind of mind-blowing concept, uh, and you've, we've seen this proliferation of the $35 Android phone, for example, in developing economies. Fundamentally, Bitcoin again is just software, so the cost of opening a bank account is zero. You're downloading software onto, let's say, a mobile phone. Um, Similarly, sending money overseas, it, it's absolutely absurd to me that um, there are traditional remittance companies that will charge you $5 to send $50 of value to somebody in another country. In a modern internet age, there's no reason that uh, that kind of value transfer should, should be so expensive. So those are a couple of different examples. And frankly speaking, again, this is why there are many implications of a protocol level innovation like this. But You've effectively taken a large closed financial system of transactions, made it open, and reduced the cost to moving some data around, just like the internet. So, much, much more efficient. And that would account for why stock exchanges and banks are taking notice and investing in, in your company and others. Yes, sir. Convert to a conventional currency and which is going to, I think, end up 
adding significant cost. Um, so is that is that the sort of if, if you had to list like three the two or three applications you think ordinary consumers who are not like Bitcoin enthusiasts are likely to use they'll be actually practical do you see those now or or what do you see coming down the pike and how long do you think it'll take before like normal people are using this kind of technology sure so um, I, I do think remittance will will be a large one to your point you do have some kind of currency conversion costs but if you look at developed foreign exchange markets those costs are on the order of basis points, not, not full percents. Um, I think the second thing, which is a little bit more abstract and difficult to predict, will, will be that it will make the internet in general a better experience. Um, one of the very strange things about how the internet evolved is that there were no economics fundamentally embedded in the internet. And this is why you have things like banner advertisements all over websites, you have spam email. It's because there's really, in the case of banner ads, there's no good way to monetize the millions of people that might hit a news site. Um, or in the case of spam email, economically, you can send a bunch of spam email without really being punished for it. Um, so imagine an internet where you actually can have economics that dictate all these behaviors, and you almost get to a version of a premium internet, if you will. I'm sure most people in this room would pay, let's say, three, five dollars a month to avoid all of that, that garbage on the internet and just really get to what you want. Um, that, would, that would be another major area that I would, I would look to. The final one is what I mentioned before around the underbanked, especially people in the developing world, where it's very difficult for a lot of these people to open a bank account. And we've, we've seen this huge trend right, of smartphones basically leapfrogging into close to 100% penetration in a lot of these countries, while bank account uh, while well, bank accounts really are lagging behind to far lower than 50% of the country, sometimes 10 to 30%. Um, I think it's actually quite possible that a lot of people have their first bank account in a purely digital format through, through something in digital currency and in Bitcoin. Way in the back. Hi, my question is actually for Chairman Goodlatt. I guess I'm concerned that you're moderating this conversation of a technology that in some fashion will appear before your committee, committee is maybe a conflict of interest and gives the appearance of blessing the technology. Well, I certainly uh, think that it's very important that the uh, technology be allowed to grow. This is not something that affects uh, uh, any uh, one business alone or any one person. It's something that has developed uh, from the grassroots and it's important that Congress needs to uh, learn about it and understand it and so we certainly intend to do that and this is one way to do that but uh, it's also important that uh, as uh, issues arise related to the technology Congress uh, holds hearings uh, on those issues and so on but it certainly uh, does not uh, uh, in any way differ from any other sector of the economy that uh, I take a keen interest in uh, from uh, rooting for the Boston Red Sox even though uh, the Judiciary Committee has jurisdiction over our antitrust laws including the uh, baseball antitrust exemption so uh, we're happy to uh, entertain uh, a wide array of different new technologies in the Congress uh, and here at State of the Net uh, and uh, d uh, my particular interest uh, does not necessarily reflect what the interests of the Congress will be uh, if and when it needs to act on any particular issue. Well, Mr. Chairman, I, th I, think, uh, I think that's it. Well, let me just, let me just close by saying that uh, this is, uh, I think, an important new technology that people need to be paying attention to. There are a great many companies. Coinbase is uh, uh, a leader in this industry, but there are many uh, companies that uh, are already in existence that are deploying the use of Bitcoins and many companies that are providing Bitcoin and, and other uh, uh, cryptocurrencies as well, not just Bitcoin, uh, that uh, uh, we here in Washington need to be taking uh, uh, notice of and certainly uh, folks in, in the tech sector need to be learning more about and figuring out how it's going to affect their business. Thank you for having me. Thank you all. Thank you, Mr. Chairman.